Hey guys, welcome back into my studio. If you want to learn how to draw this squirrel using nothing but slice tools, or you're a little bit intrigued to know how slice tools compare to my normal tools, then keep watching. Hey guys, like I said, today we're gonna to be learning how to draw this squirrel using nothing but the slice tools. Now I wanna start by giving a big shout out to Slice. They have kindly provided me with the different tools and all the different blades that I needed to draw this artwork. So big thank you to them. Um, it was very kind, very generous of them to send me through those supplies. Now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about why I chose to do a squirrel. So I was looking for a reference photo that was gonna challenge uh, my normal tools that I would normally use, for example, my tattoo needles. And when I came across this reference photo, I saw quite a lot of different fur textures, which I thought would be a nice little challenge. So obviously you've got this area of very bright white fur at the bottom. Um, you've got very, very short fur on the squirrel's head going into sort of the medium to short length fur on his back and on his leg. And then obviously you've got the main event, which is big, big, fluffy, um, tail that's going to use it's going to challenge a lot of my techniques normally because I, for this area I would normally use one of my tattoo needles because it will create a lot of depth and stop me going too bright too quickly so that was a little bit of a challenge and I wanted to make sure the slice tools could handle that um, so without further ado let's get on to the video so with this piece and with any of my pieces, like I said, especially in my last video, you have to start by thinking where am I going to start. Um, so like I said, I normally love to start with the eye. Now you'll end up seeing in this video um, the reference photo that I've used. Um, the eye, especially in the squirrel, hasn't really got that much detail. It's really just um, sort of like a black circle with a highlight in it. Um, so I didn't really feel that I could start there. I felt like I needed to ease my way into this drawer in a little bit. Um, now the reason why I haven't shared the reference photo with you guys like I did in my last video um, was because this photo is actually paid for. So it's a bought reference photo off a website called Wildlife Reference Photos. Um, so I bought this photo for me to use in my artwork. Um, if you like the photo, if you like my drawing and you want to use the photo, um, then just pop over to that website and you should be able to find it there underneath the squirrel section. So in this almost tutorial, little bit of a review from Slice, um, I'm gonna be trying to use all of the different tools and all of the different blades that Slice have provided for me. Um, so I'm gonna slowly sort of work my way through this drawing, um, especially just because it's gonna be very hard for me to get the very, very light furs, fur strokes, sorry, that I normally use on the almost the bottom layers, the layers that are the deepest in the fur. I normally go, as I said in my previous video, very, very light in that section. Um, and my tattoo needle was probably the best, best tool for that really. So it was trying to find a different tool or a different blade um, that could mimic that or give me the same texture of that. And the tool that I found the best, well, it wasn't really the tool, it was actually the blade. It was the corner stripping blade that um, I have used in some of my previous videos. I found that I could get the lightest stroke with that. Um, so you'll probably see that's the blade that I use the most and it's the one with the sort of like the uh, slate charcoal colored handle, the one that I'm using now. Um, that's the one that I've put the corner stripping blade in. So you'll probably see that I use that an awful lot in this tutorial, in this video. So I started um, around the head on this on this one, um, just because the fur there was incredibly short um, and I knew that this was gonna be a little bit of a challenge for me. So I wanted to make sure that I could get that area in first and make sure it was up to scratch before I moved on to any other section of the drawing. And I probably find, because I didn't have to really think about my pressure when I was using my tattoo needles, um, I could move a lot faster, so I found this using the slice tools was a little bit slower than what I normally would only because I was very very conscious about the pressure that I was putting down and for my style the way I work it is a lot about layers so I like to get a lot of layers in my work and in order to do that I can't go too bright too quickly I do have to be very very light with my strokes. So you'll see that the technique that I'm using in this video um, is very similar to the one that I'd always use really. So I start off with a layer of very, very light, very faint looking fur, um, just to give myself 
a bit of a plan um, in the direction that that fur is going. Um, so as you'll see, I go in with these light strokes and then I go back in with almost another layer um, of medium strokes. Now in order to get these, especially for this one where I'm using solely the, the slice tools, um, I go in with just a varying amount of pressure. So I don't necessarily change the blade to a different blade, I just push down that little bit harder and it gives me a slightly lighter stroke and therefore I can use that. I can still use the same blade, I don't have to change my blade out or change my tool. I can just press a little bit harder and get that, get that lighter stroke. Now getting to this area here around the muzzle, um, it was very, very difficult. So normally I'd probably use one of my round liner tattoo needles because it's got, you know, anywhere from three, five, nine needles on the end of that tattoo needle. And what that does is it creates a lot of lines in one stroke. However, with these slice tools, I was having to put down each individual stroke. So I was going very, very close together with my strokes and trying to be very, very light because again, like I said, didn't want to go in too bright too quickly. Um, I can always go back in and re-establish those lights, go a little bit brighter, um, and knock things back a little bit, but if I go too light too quickly, I do find it a little bit hard um, to go in and adjust that. Now I really enjoyed using these slice tools, especially the one that I've got now in my hand. Um, that was almost the upgraded version of the one that I originally bought myself. Um, now I found, obviously you can see with the blade that I'm using now and the tool that I'm using now, it hasn't got the orange lid on and that's because again, it rolled and dropped off the table, which is sort of a never going nightmare with that tool. However, with this new upgraded one, um, it does have this orange sheath that you can sort of see around the midsection of the pen that slides down and covers the blade and therefore protects it a little bit better. So it was really good in the fact that it could do that. It felt pretty much exactly the same as the one that I'm holding now, um, so it didn't feel too different. The The structure of the pen felt pretty much the same, so it wasn't too, too much of a change for me to use that. So I probably use that a little bit more um, than any of the other tools. Now I've tried to use pretty much every tool and, and pretty much every blade um, in, this, in this drawing. Um, I didn't want to sort of leave anything out. Now the only tool that didn't get as much use is the retractable precision cutter. Um, now this is the one that looks like a normal standard pen, um, it's white with the, um, the orange top that you kicked down. Now the reason it didn't get as much use isn't because it's a bad tool in any way, um, I actually got along with it really well. It's just the blade um, that came out of the bottom, um, it was very similar um, to a few of the other blades that I've got um, with slicing that I used in the rest of the piece. Um, so I didn't really feel it necessary to use that one as much. Um, but it's still a really good, really good tool. So you can use it for a lot of different techniques. So you can give a lot of pressure with it. Um, you can create quite light. When I say light, I don't mean bright. I mean quite um, faint looking strokes, um, which are really good for giving a bit of depth to your piece. Now the only downside to this pen is that because of the shape of the blade that comes out of the end, you do have to angle the pen slightly just so that you can see where you're putting down your strokes. Um, but after a few minutes of use, this really becomes um, sort of second nature. It doesn't really cause much of an issue. Now from doing that video, I found I knew a little bit about what I was gonna use for different areas of the squirrel. So I knew that the, um, the one that looks a little bit like a Stanley knife, so the, the big um, manual pen cutter, um, I found that that one was incredibly good at getting very, very bright highlights. So I already knew that I was probably gonna use that one on the belly of the squirrel and also a little bit on the neck and the back where the highlights are the brightest. And I knew I was going to come back in and sort of touch up little areas on the hand, maybe the whiskers, um, and just, just touch up those highlights a little bit.
So just to show you a little bit about which blades I've got in different in which tools. Obviously you can see now I've got the manual pen cutter which is that almost like I say a Stanley knife looking blade. In this slate grey charcoal coloured one um, I've got my corner stripping blade. In the one that I've got with the orange sheath, this one here, I've got the um, pointed, the very very pointed tip blade. Um, and they're the sort of the three blades that are mainly used. Um, you'll probably see if you, if you, like I say, if you go back and watch the the unboxing video, I'd like to call it maybe, um, of the slice tools and the very quick review of the different techniques and the different um, styles that I could get with that. Um, I found that the chisel tip blade, it again didn't really suit my style too much. The ones that I've chosen to go in this video are probably the ones that will really work the best for scratch board in my opinion. Now, you know, you're not gonna know, like I said in that previous video, you're not gonna know which tools work best for you and which give you the best marks until you try them out for yourself really. Um, just because I do a lot of fur in my work, a lot of wildlife, doesn't mean that these tools are going to be um, specifically suited for portraiture or um, landscape. You know, I mainly do fur, so that's what I'm giving my opinion on. Now, especially on this part of the drawing, I had to pay particular attention, like I say again, to the direction that the fur strokes would go in. Now this part is his arm, now it overlaps his body a little bit as well, so the fur beneath the arm changes direction a little bit, so I had to make sure that I gave it enough direction and enough individuality um, just so that it stood out a little bit from the rest of the body. Now what I made sure to do as well is leave a very very small area of black um, just underneath his forearm where I'm working now and also just round the elbow and where it meets the body and what this did is it gave it a little bit of separation from the body um, because I found that when I was looking at the reference photo there wasn't too much separation um, but sometimes you have to adjust your artwork a little bit just so that it doesn't you know get a little bit confusing for the viewer so I wanted to make it very clear that this part here was the arm that I was working on. Now what I've done here by accident is I went a little bit too light um, and I know that by comparing my reference photo up to my actual drawing so what I had to do was go a little bit lighter on my hands and you'll see at the end I go in a little bit with a little bit of indie rink um, a little bit of touch up repairing, water down, just to re-darken that area and give it a little bit more shadow. Now you're probably wondering what those marks are in the top right hand corner. Well, if you're looking at my board straight on, it'd be the top left hand corner, um, just where it's a slightly different shade. Now, what happened here was I noticed that there were some marks on my board and I could only see them when it was in a certain light and a certain angle. Um, you probably couldn't see them on the video too much, um, but I was scared that once I'd varnished my piece, those marks were still going to be there. So all I did was get some India ink. I didn't water it down at all and I just placed that over over those areas. Now those areas will blend in absolutely fine once I varnish my piece. Um, they do just stand out a little bit before the varnish but that's absolutely fine because I know that they're going to vanish after I varnish my piece. Now I don't know if you saw this in my last video but this video shows that I'm using almost just like this black cloth just to rest my hand on. Now the reason for that is, like I said before, when you when you scratch on scratch board, it leaves a very, very fine dust just on the surface that you can blow off. You can rub it back into the board just to re-darken areas. But if you forget to do that and, the, and it's just resting on top of the board, if you rest your hand on certain areas that you want to be light or you want to be the lightest fur, it can actually rub some of that some of that ink back into those areas and it can cause those areas to become darker again so then you have to go back over and rework those areas so I found that as well as gloves I just sometimes pop this cloth just down and it just rests my hand on and it just stops me from worrying about re-darkening areas that I know I want to be light now 
Now at one point during this video I did actually change the blade that was in the um, the craft knife, the one with the orange sheath on it. Now I changed it from the, the pointed blade to the, the one with the more curved end and what I found with this was that it allowed me to get a broader stroke and an almost like a brighter stroke and I actually put my sharp pointed blade now as you can see in the scalpel. Now when I gave the first review of this scalpel I, th I didn't really think I was going to get along with it but if I'm completely honest it's actually became one of my favorite tools. It was so light in my hand that you could almost be forgiven and forgetting that you were holding it to be honest. So I ended up putting my um, the sharp pointed blade, the one we'd normally associate with being a craft blade like a number 11 blade in that holder just because it was so so comfortable. Now again now moving on to this back leg I had to make sure that I was certain in the direction that the fur was going. You'll see that it contours around as it goes almost behind the squirrel. So I was looking at the direction in which my light was coming from. Now most of the time it was coming from the sort of the very top of the squirrel. So this area that I could almost describe as being his knee was further away from his body than what the rest of the fur on that leg was. So I had to make sure that I knew this area would be catching the light more than than the area that was going to be receded down towards the tail. So I had to make sure that I got those that balance of light and dark correct in that area. Otherwise I was scared it was going to give the whole drawer in a bit of a an unnatural feel. So I had to really concentrate on almost the contours of this leg. And that's when it goes back to you know making sure you study your reference photo. Make sure you know the animal that you draw in. Um, because if you don't study your reference photo, you may just assume, because the fur is going to be the same colour roughly on this part of his leg, that it's all the same tonal value and it's not unfortunately. That part of the knee and that front part of that leg is going to have a brighter highlight on it than this back portion. So what I made sure as well to do was I went back in after I'd finished all my lights and I re-darkened those areas just with that little bit of India ring. when I'm doing the fur I'm making sure that I'm not putting all my lines in the same almost the same plane the same direction I don't want them lined up almost as soldiers really um, so I know I said in my last video I was curving my strokes just to give a more fluffy um, almost more dynamic texture now the texture that's in this squirrel the fur is almost a lot straighter it does overlap and I do create I do have curves to the lines, um, but the fur is a lot straighter than it was in that leopard eye tutorial. Um, but in order to make sure that your fur doesn't look unnatural or you know too rigid, you do still have to make sure that your overlapping lines and your um, curving lines and making making your fur look how it would or how you'd imagine it would look on an actual squirrel. You know, this animal, it lives in the wild, it lives, you know, in shrubbery, in bushes, in trees. You know, it's not going to have fur that looks like it's been combed. There is going to be some, some overlaying of that fur. Now you can see now I've moved on to the lightest section of the body, which is this underbelly. Now I had to make sure that I got this right because too bright and all my other areas would look too dark and not bright enough and I'd have no sort of dynamic flow to my piece. So I put in initially a layer of very very light fur down with the corner stripping blade and then I went back in with the curved tip on the um, the one with the orange sheath so almost like my newer um, craft knife and once I did that I did press quite hard in order to get that light fur and then what I made sure to do is when I came in with you know the scalpel with the with the pointed blade I made sure just to create a few little flyaways a few little unnatural hairs from what I saw on my reference photo and it just gave it a little bit of dynamic feel it didn't feel so rigid after I did that if that makes sense so like I say the reference photo is only a reference I've said it before 
um, what you do to your picture. You know, it's down to you. If you want to add a few little hairs here and there, a few little flyaways just to make it look more natural, um, then go ahead because, you know, it's your piece of artwork. So again, this area down at that belly and on the inside of that right leg, I had to make sure, well, to be honest, it was very hard because I had to get really, really close with my first strokes. Like I say, I normally use my tattoo needles for that area. So it took me a lot longer than what I normally would just to create that fur. And um, I had to try and make sure there was no gaps. So this part of the drawing shows you a little bit about how I tackle this sort of furry texture. So this is the same texture and this is the same technique really that I'd used in order to tackle, let's say a lion's mane or any fur that was long and wiry, almost fluffy in places. So the trick to this area is just an awful lot of layers. You know, if you have to go in and darken all the areas up with some India ink and then go over them again, just to create loads and loads of layers, that's what's probably gonna work best for this technique or what I found works best for this technique. And the last thing you want is straight lines in this section. So I, I make sure my lines are very, very wavy, very wriggly, because in this section, that's what's gonna cause sort of the appearance of fluffiness, if that makes sense. So again, same way that I create normal fur, I go in with a very, very light layer, feel out the direction, plot where my darks and where my lights are gonna be, and then I go in with a little bit more pressure, a little bit harder pressure, a little bit more forceful strokes, and then when I need to, I change my blade up to that harder blade, to that bigger blade, sorry, just so that I can create those, almost the top highlights on that area. So that just about does it now for this um, this slice overview. Um, once again, I want to give a big shout out to Slice for providing me with the tools for this piece. I hope it's given me a little bit of insight into how the different tools and how the different blades work. You know, if there's anything further you want to see, if you want me to elaborate on any areas, just drop me a message and I'll be happy to reply. I may even do a little video going into the different areas of this drawing, such as the tail, such as the short fur. But yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you all again in the next video.